Tests are an integral part of life as a student, especially when the school runs on the quarter system. Even outside the context of academia, our lives are full of tests. The first test in my day consists of one question and happens when my alarm goes off. True or false, I will get out of bed right now. <laughs> Later in the day, there might be a multiple choice question. Which of the following are you going to do next? A, continue preparing your reflection for Sunday. B, strike up a conversation with students. C, take a break and go for a walk. Or D, respond to emails. In each of these situations, there is an answer I prefer, but that may or may not be the answer that would be most beneficial for me to choose. Then there are test questions in my day that have deeper implications. For example, this free response question. Someone just said something to me that, in, that I interpreted as disrespecting my ego. How will I choose to respond? All of these situations are examples of various levels of a temptation, which comes from the Latin word meaning having been tested. Temptations in the most general sense pull us from the choice we prefer towards other choices that also reflect our values, testing which values are more important to us. Some temptations present us opportunities to choose between obeying or disobeying God, thus testing our integrity and character. But before we can think about choosing to obey or disobey God, we have to ask ourselves, do I trust God? I imagine for many of us here, the answer is, it depends on fill in the blank. Faltering in trust or faith in God is exactly the seed of discord that Satan plants in the hearts of Adam and Eve in our first reading today. Imagine that we're back in the garden where everything is as God willed it to be, that human beings like God and the angels know exactly what is good and evil. But how can someone who knows what is good and evil choose to sin? In the allegory, humans choose to eat from the tree because they believe it was good for food, pleasing to the eyes, and desirable for gaining wisdom. The only thing that changed within them was that they judged that for whatever reason, maybe God was hiding something from them. Similarly, if each of us was to look back at a recent temptation to sin, part of our struggle might have been something telling us, would God really think this is wrong? Or, surely doing this would be the right thing because I think it looks good. Our first reading reminds us that even though these thoughts, these temptations to rely solely on ourselves to decide what's right and wrong, are part of who we are, but God didn't make them to be part of us. God did not make us to distrust his character and motives. God gives us the virtue of faith at our baptisms to counter our tendency to distrust him. While we who are baptized have faith, we've allowed the Holy Spirit to cultivate it within us to varying degrees. There's a so-called blind faith, which is when our relationship with God is not dynamic, when we don't know God or don't allow God to know us. We accept anything and everything we're told without letting it take root in how we live. This is a false faith and one that will inevitably lead to a distrust in God. On the other hand, a faith that strengthens our trust in God is one in which we are attuned to how God is working in our lives. One way we can evaluate the depth of our faith is to examine the extent to which we are willing to bear our souls in front of God, to be spiritually naked and vulnerable before a God who loves us, rather than trying to hide parts of ourselves behind metaphorical fig leaves. Trusting in God enables us to obey God more readily. The word obedience can be especially neuralgic in American culture, because we might associate it with being forced to do something against our will. As Christians, obedience is something that is much more intentional. The root of the word means to act due to listening to, paying attention to, 
or accepting. In other words, we not only hear what someone says, but those words make an impact on us. Something within us is different. We internalize what we've heard. Contrary to what our culture may believe about obedience as an unfreedom, Christian obedience is not only an act freely taken, but it's the only proper use of our free will God gifted us. St. Paul tells the Romans in our second reading about the contrasting figures of Adam and Jesus, how one abused his free will to disobey God and thus condemned humanity to death, and how the other used his free will properly to obey God and thus restored life to all humanity, past, present, and future. Restoring us to life is what the seasons of Lent and Easter are all about. In fact, this message is so important that we not only spend more than three months in these two seasons alone, but our readings today begin by telling us that our Creator God breathed into each of us so that we could become living beings. If our only focus in Lent is on temptation, sin, and death, then we've missed the purpose of Lent as preparing us for Easter, for the message of victory, faith, obedience, and life. These next six, week, six weeks of penitential waiting and spiritual training is the time we have in the life of the church to slow down and live with greater meaning and purpose through prayer, fasting, and giving of ourselves and what God has given us. Much like how Jesus gave up bread when he was hungry because he understood that one does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God, so we give up or do something not for its own sake, but as a way to grow closer to God. In other words, we begin Lent, the question we first ask ourselves isn't, what are you giving up for Lent, but how are you going to depend more on God? How are you going to be more united with God? Focusing on how we can be more dependent on God also removes the temptation to keep track of the number of continuous days we can give up something. So often I encounter people who give in and think, well, that's the end, as if Lent for them has ended prematurely. Relying on our own willpower goes against the purpose of this season. Second, Jesus shows us the power of prayer because he was led by the Spirit into the desert. This speaks to how he turned himself totally over to the Holy Spirit during his metaphorical 40 days in the desert. Similarly, during the 40-ish days of Lent for us, we're not meant to face tests and trials alone. Our experiences tell us that while there are many ways to fight temptations, the only way we can be victorious over them is through prayer. Whether it's praying with Newman's daily Lenten reflections, the sacraments of Eucharist and Reconciliation, or another form of prayer that nourishes our soul, using this season to cultivate a habit of prayer is a great way to be aware of when we need to rely more on God and less on ourselves. Ultimately, what we desire when we gather here every Sunday at Eucharist is to one day rejoin God in the garden where we can perfectly be what God made us to be.